That's right. Good, good call. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Earl also worked for a commercial feed uh, company for several years before we recruited him back into the cooperative extension system where uh, he served as an area livestock specialist in the northeast corner of the state now for several years. So with that, Earl, we're looking forward to your presentation. All right. You're going to have to help me. Are you seeing the right thing or do I need to switch? No, looks good. Can you see the main slide there, Dr. Yes, sir. All right. So Dr. Longman approached me about uh, talking about range cubes here. Um, and, and mainly I want to focus on range cubes, but not only range cubes, but a lot of our dry feeds um, as far as byproducts, grains, and such things like that. We're going to talk a little bit about protein sources and kind of what we need to think about about feed management. Um, so as we go through this, um, that's the couple of things we're going to highlight. So the reason this is extremely important, and all of you know how much money you spend at, uh, at the feed store, but if we just look at our nutrition costs and uh, we talk about our hay and harvested forages, roughages, things like that, our concentrate feeds, the, the cubes that we buy or we buy a commodity mix or whatever, our minerals, that accounts for about 40% of our operating costs. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen those, those numbers where you know, if we consider all nutrition, meaning our, our pasture rentals and uh, all anything considered nutrition, that accounts for 40 to 50% of our total annual cow cost. So uh, what that tells me is, is that is our greatest opportunity for saving money. So if we can save, you know, uh, a little bit of money, this is our, our best place where we can do it. And we need to fine tune our management to do that. Uh, to do that, I think you definitely need to start looking at a yearly evaluation of your whole supplementation and feeding program. Um, I, hopefully by the, the end of this, you realize there's a difference between feeding and supplementation. Uh, um, you know, feeding is we're, we're providing most of it through what we're, we're giving them. Supplementation is something that we're adding uh, that's a benefit and uh, making up for areas where we're already deficient. Um, and if we don't do that every year, we all agree that every year is different as far as moisture, temperatures, and things like that. Our forage availability is all different and quality will be different. The reason we really want to focus on nutrition here is because, you know, our repro efficiency is our, our greatest indicator of, you know, economical gain or loss. So we need to focus on keeping our nutrition up to maximize our reproductive efficiency within the cow herd. So today we're going to talk about supplementation. Okay, and a supplementation basically we're talking about using feeds to enhance the utilization of a base forage. In the cow calf industry, we are forage based systems, um, unless you got cows in, in dry lots uh, or hoop houses or something. But again, they still have to have that, that form of roughage. So we're looking for a supplement that will improve the nutritional value of the overall diet. Okay, so some goals for our supplements. We need to overcome the limitations on digestion and intake of forage as forage quality declines. So from now until January, February, our quality of forage is going to drop down unless we have some sort of cool season grasses. And I think some later presentations in the coming weeks will address some of those options. The other thing that our supplement needs to do is improve our rumen microbial function to increase the fermentation and passage rate. So when we're feeding the rumen an animal, we're feeding two animals. We're feeding those microbes inside the rumen and their job is to break down all of the ingredients that come in, whether it's starch, cellulose and whatnot and increase, if we can increase the function of that microbial, uh, you know, population, then we can increase how much nutrients go from the animal from from mouth to end, okay? So that passage rate, uh, and we get that animal running up. So if we pick the wrong supplementation or an unneeded supplementation, all we're doing there is increasing our feed cost with very little benefits, okay? We go back to that yearly uh, evaluation. Most of the people that I've dealt with in the feed industry, they feed the same thing 
year after year after year without any consideration of what their forage quality and quantity would be, okay? Hopefully through these series, you learn how to fine tune your management to figure out where can I save money to reduce the cost I'm spending on nutrition. All right, so I have this up. This would basically be like a guaranteed analysis on a pellet. Uh, crude protein at 18%, crude fat four and a half, and crude fiber at 16. Uh, most people would look at that and, and say, hey, that's, that looks like a pretty decent feed if that's what I'm going for. But I, I have to warn producers that a 20% cube from you know, uh, meal A is totally, could be totally different than a 20% cube from meal B, okay? So um, knowing the ingredients, I can make a, an 18% cube out of just about anything, all right? So I always like to throw this picture up. This is a picture of my, my oldest boy when he was little. And if you look at the picture, you see one of two things. You either see a little boy with a great looking mullet, or you see a little boy with his grandmother sitting behind him in a perfect position. If you look closely, you can see her arm right there underneath his arm, right? So I always show this picture to say, looks can be deceiving. So if we are just looking at that feed, that guaranteed analysis without looking at the ingredients or seeing how that was formulated, we're not seeing the entire picture. So for instance, that guaranteed analysis was looking at the ingredients of wood chips, clay, motor oil, and lawn fertilizer, okay? You can make a pellet out of just about anything, but it's the quality of that pellet that really goes into how the animal can use it, okay? So beware of what's in it. Check and ask for ingredients. Uh, if it looks really, really cheap compared to something else, man, we really need to evaluate you know, why is it that much cheaper? So if we look at our sources of crude protein, we mainly have three different sources uh, that the animal can consume. What we're normally seeing is our plant proteins. These are our soybean meals, cottonseed meal, uh, alfalfa, linseed meal, anything to me uh, that is, you know, a higher protein and by higher, I mean, you know, 18% or higher can be used as a protein supplementation. But these are our plant proteins. Our other source would be animal proteins, which is meat and bone meal uh, or blood meal. However, it is illegal to uh, feed ruminant derived protein to other ruminants, and that includes even small ruminants. Uh, even on the blood meal, it has to be sure that there is no bone or anything included in the blood meal. Um, so I will tell you that most meals are not going to deal with this. They, they will sign affidavits saying that they have no animal proteins, uh, you know, on their premise just to try to avoid any sort of, um, you know, opening up a can of worms for that situation. Our last source is our non-protein proteins. Our non-protein nitrogen is what you'll hear them ask. And that's where we talk about urea, biuret, or ammonia. Um, and basically that's just a straight source of protein. I'll tell you how that's kind of broken down in the next coming slides. So this is an, an old chart or graph here, um, but basically um, it does a really good job of illustrating how each feed ingredient can be broken down. Um, and what it's looking at is how long does it take for the rumen to degrade that, that, that protein? Anything that's above uh, the main line there, any, uh, let's just say anything below that's in the gray, that's bypass protein. So that's everything that's gonna be passing through the rumen and either digested in the hindgut or passed out into the fecal. Uh, anything above that gray box is gonna be broken down inside the rumen. So again, when we're feeding two animals, we're feeding the rumen and then we're feeding the animal you can see how each one of these are broken down. So um, your urea there, you see 100% of that is broken down inside the rumen. So the biggest benefit for your, having urea in the diet is feeding those microbes in the rumen. When we get to like distiller's grains, uh, that you see there's a slow digestion of those and about half of it is degradable in the rumen and half of it isn't. Well, that's very popular with like stockers and growers and 
because there's enough protein there to feed our micro bugs, but then there's also that bypass protein that gets absorbed in the hindgut and feeds the animal. So even though we may have a 20% cube, depending on the quality of the protein that we use, the animal would utilize it in total different ways. So here's kind of an illustration that I've put together of how this works. Uh, first, we need to point out that crude protein is a simple measure of nitrogen inside the feed. And then we multiply that times 6.25. So no matter how much, whatever nitrogen is in there, uh, you know, uh, we multiply that times 6.25 and that gives us our crude protein. So if we, I always make the joke that if we cut a room and right in half, you get a perfect box like that, but that's not how it works. But we do have this large fermentation vat there and you'll see three layers. You'll see that white area would be a gas layer uh, where gas is being produced. You'll see the green layer there. That is where there's a, a floating mat. Uh, and that's where a lot of the microbes are gonna live and they're because they're constantly breaking down that, that feed ingredient that's, that's in that sitting there floating. Then there's pour, more of a liquid layer underneath and that still has a lot of particulates in it. A lot of uh, microbes are still in there, but a lot of dead microbes. And I'll talk about how they're used in just a minute. So if we have a certain feed and we pour that down that animal's esophagus into the rumen, we talked about how some of that is going to escape the rumen. It's gonna be in a bypass protein. So it's gonna escape this microbe digestion and move further down the line. Let's say about 60% of it goes into the rumen. It gets changed to ammonia. Well, then the ammonia is going to feed those microbes. And that's what's gonna, the more we can feed those microbes in the healthy population that we have there, well, then all of a sudden, increased in forage digestibility, which increases the rate of passage. So that means dry matter intake is going to go up because feed is coming through the system faster. That ammonia is also going to leave the rumen, hit the bloodstream, go to the liver. The liver can then either send it out through the urine or recycle it back through the saliva. So there is some sort of uh, nitrogen recycling there. Okay. Those dead microbes that are, are are coming out of this particulate, they can go to the hindgut and be broken down into amino acids and used as a protein source in the hindgut for the animal. A lot of that is absorbed into the blood and then the rest is expelled into the feces. So when we pour an ingredient in, the amount that changes from degradable and undegradable is different for each ingredient. So you, again, be mindful of you know, what is the quality of ingredients going into these uh, range cubes? If we look at a non-protein nitrogen source, and we talked about urea earlier, if you think about how much nitrogen is in urea, well, it's 4600, right? So 46% nitrogen. We multiply that 46 times 6.25, that tells us it's about 287% crude protein. So if we have our urea preels here and we send them down into the rumen 100 percent of them are broken down into a rumen and if you've ever had a, a bag of urea on your yard and you waited it in you've seen those preels disappear real fast you know it happens very rapidly okay so that ammonia feeds the bugs the rest of it goes out through the liver and is cycled the same way okay there is no bypass protein to that source um, so a lot of times if you'll look at your, your feed labels and it says there's a non-protein nitrogen in it, uh, it's either urea or biuret or something like that. And that's where it's beneficial is if we have a really low crude protein forage and it's not high enough protein to feed these microbes, well then if we had this ingredient that, that did, its sole purpose is to, to feed the microbes, well then that'd be an advantageous to feeding that low quality forage. So there's a reason these are used in, in our feed industry. Everything happens the same way uh, as we move down the system, okay? What we do need to caution people on is overconsumption of, of non-protein nitrogen. If there is an overconsumption of it, you will see more of it coming out of the rumen into the bloodstream. And when it gets to the liver, the liver gets overloaded 
changes that ammonia back to urea, puts it in the blood, and that's when you get urea toxicity uh, and uh, is detrimental to the, to the animal. So I want you to know kind of of the places I've worked, what, what is in a range cube? And it's basically byproducts, uh, wheat, mids, soy hulls, corn, gluten, distillers, grains. You have your protein sources, your cottonseed meal, soybean meal. They're probably gonna have some sort of limestone in there and that's there for two reasons, uh, to offset your phosphorus uh, and get your calcium levels up, but then also it makes a really good cube. It, um, and then you're gonna have to have some sort of binder, binder molasses, uh, depending on, you know, the, the type of cube that you're getting, um, it, it could or could not have vitamins in it. Uh, a lot of times if you see a breeder cube, if it's labeled a breeder cube, that means they put vitamin A in it. Um, your, your cubes may or may not have minerals in them. Uh, and you can also have antibiotics, ionophores, any other special ingredients that you want, um, you know, depending on how much you buy. You can pretty much tell them to put whatever you want into it, uh, but there will be a minimum amount of how much you can order. So nothing really crazy that should go into them. I, you know, by this time of year, everybody's booking prices are out. So they've got these ingredients locked in uh, uh, through March, most likely. And therefore, they're probably not going to change formulations too much between now and March. Uh, you know, if all of a sudden some cash prices open up, they might change formulations where you can substitute you know, some soybean holes for wheat mids or something like that, corn gluten for DDGs. But essentially, these are kind of the ingredients. So working in the feed industry, uh, one thing that kind of, there's some, some pet peeves of mine and I hear them quite a bit. And so it is, I feed a four-way, okay? Uh, I feed a commodity four-way. Well, all of these are commodities or 99% of them are, are, are byproducts anyway. But typically, your four-way is soy holes, wheat mids, corn gluten, and either DDGs or corn. Now, when they say I'm, I made a four-way or I feed a four-way, it could be anything. And the other thing, it could be in different inclusion rates. That's not saying this four-way is 25% of each ingredient. They're just saying there's four ingredients. Um, so know what, you're, what you do have, what is in there because there's a huge difference between that mix, whether you use distiller's grains or corn. Um, and then almost in all of these, you need to really start looking at uh, if they don't have any added minerals, having your own uh, mineral. Another thing that I, I always hear a lot is I ordered corn in my feed and my cubes and I don't see any. We realize to make that cube, we have to grind everything down to a, you know, a powder to be able to get everything to mix uh, consistently to make a really good pellet. If you do see some corn in your cubes, that means that they threw some chopped corn in there just enough to where you can pretty much see it to make customers happy. Um, but the biggest majority of it's gonna be ground and it's just gonna look like all the other ingredients. I caution you on, hey, I wanna see corn in there. And the reason is anytime you put a corn kernel in that cube, it could cause you know, that's a weak point um, in that cube and results in smaller, shorter and broken cubes and more fines in your, in your overhead bin. So uh, believe the mill, if they said they put corn in it and you don't see it, it, it could be ground in, and mixed with everything else. So. so to me, again, what is a good supplement? It's one that works with you. And what do we need to look at to choose the right supplement? Well, it's your forage quality. So I'm gonna give examples here. Uh, this was forage samples brought into Muskogee County in 2020. Uh, each one of those dots is a forage sample brought in. Uh, you see crude protein along the bottom and then uh, TDN, total digestible nutrients going up the top. Uh, so each one of those samples represents where that sample would fall in this scale. Don't get bogged down to where they all are, but again, anything to me, anything over about 15% crude protein, you probably need to start looking at either limiting how much they eat of that forage or use it as a supplement. And I believe Dana Zook will be talking about like using alfalfa or something as a supplement uh, in the next coming weeks. So I like to look at these. I like to draw those boxes right there. And basically what I'm saying is if I had a 1200 pound lactating cow, her nutrient requirements are 
three pounds of crude protein a day, 17.6 pounds of TDN a day. And if she's eating 30 pounds uh, a day, then that means the, four, the total diet needs to be greater than 10% crude protein and greater than 58% TDN to meet her requirements, her maintenance requirements, all right? So if we look at that peach box down there in the bottom, what it's saying is anything that's in that box has met her crude protein requirement, but is short of energy. Anything in the blue box says we have met her energy requirement, but not her protein. So those are two different supplements right there. I mean, the way we should think of that all of a sudden should totally change the supplements that we're looking at. Anything in the green box, giving no weather stress or she's already in good body condition, those forages there should meet both of her requirements and should not need any supplementation, okay? The ones that's still in the white there in the left corner, uh, left bottom corner, again, they're gonna need supplementations of, of both crude protein and energy. So what I've done is I've taken each one of those samples and I said, okay, for that 1,200 pound cow that I talked about, how much supplementation would it take to meet her requirements with a 14% retail product, a 20% retail product, and a 37%? So that's what this shows. And you see that some of them, there's nothing there, right? Uh, like the third sample over, there's nothing there because that sample meets the animal's requirements. There shouldn't even be any nutritional uh, needed for that. You see some of them, uh, like halfway down, you're talking over eight pounds of a 14% to meet her requirements. So don't get bogged down in what each one of these do, but just realize that the taller that blue bar is means we're short of protein. If you look down and towards the bottoms and you see those at the 14s, 20s, and 37s are really close together, uh, that means we're short of energy. Those samples need an energy supplementation and not a, a, a protein. So we need to focus on where's our forage, what supplement best matches that forage. We don't need to be looking at what is our cost per ton we need to be looking at what is our cost per head per day, all right? Now, in Eastern Oklahoma, our number one supplement sold by far is a 20% cube. We sell more of that than any other feed in, in Eastern Oklahoma. Very seldom is it the most economical. And I, I'll, I'll say for this 1200 pound animal, it changes as we, move animal sizes and stage of production. But what this chart right here shows is if you see the tall bars, that means that a 37% cube was the cheapest option. If you see the short ones, that means a 14% cube was the cheapest option. And of all of those samples submitted, there was only one where a 20% cube was the most economical option, okay? You see my, my prices up there in the corner, that's kind of the prices I was I was told a couple months ago uh, that we're where we'd be. So as those prices change, these, these bars may change. So does it make a big difference? Well, it depends on your situation. So what I looked at then was if we switch from a 20% cube to whatever supplement was cheapest, and let's say we had 50 cows and we're feeding them 100 days, are there any savings? Well, for some producers, it wouldn't make a hill of beans, okay? But for some producers where we're getting over a thousand, it could save them a thousand dollars over a hundred days. That's when we really need to start looking at, okay, well, if I can save a thousand dollars, that's a lot of money to my operation. So again, had we not done our forage sample and then evaluated which supplement best fits that, we wouldn't have been able to save this amount of money. And we need to do that every year. <clears throat> so kind of to finish us up here, I always get this question every year, when should I start feeding my cows? I always say, let your cows tell you when you need to start feeding. You need to be watching your body condition scores really good. Once you see them dropping off, you're looking at your forage conditions, you're looking at the cows. Uh, 
that's when they saying, all right, now we need some sort of supplementation. Uh, maybe it's through your hay. Maybe it's, uh, you know, we're, we're changing, you know, we're feeding 37s now because we're on native, but come January when we start feeding hay, then we need to start feeding 14s or, or whatever. Best way to see what kind of gut health they have is looking at their manure piles. Um, if they're stacking up too tall and they're tight and dry, we need some protein in there to get those ruined bugs working. Uh, we want them to hit the ground wet, but not splatter. Uh, so that's the good healthy one. And then of course, if they're splattering too much, we're probably putting too much uh, through the system. So I'm gonna encourage you to work with your, your OSU Extension Educator, develop a feeding supplementation strategy. All right, so get those forage analysis done, uh, get that information back because you may see that, hey, I can feed this quality of forage to this type of animal with no supplementation. And I'm gonna feed this lower quality forage to those animals that have a lower nutrient requirement. So that's a strategy, uh, not just I'm feeding whatever. I've got, a, I've got a purpose of why I'm doing this. Uh, if you need help looking at your supplement and valuation, we have several tools through OSU. Uh, you can go to our beef extension website. You'll see the little blue arrow down there looking at those calculators. Um, you have the calculator program there. You have a, a, a cheap and or really easy uh, supplementation program that's you know very basic that I made. Uh, if you have any questions on that, you know, Dr. Lom and I, your county educator, we can all help with that uh, and help you evaluate what supplement strategy works best for you. So, Dr. Lom and I think I've rambled long enough. Outstanding. Thank you, Earl. Let me just encourage everyone watching, if you have a question, uh, please uh, just go ahead and type it in the chat and we'll get to those. Uh, here in just a few minutes after Dr. Del Curto's presentation. Uh, but Earl, I, a couple of uh, observations, I guess. Number one, I think uh, $1,000 savings, they could sure buy their area livestock specialists a nice new office chair or a new <laughs> shotgun or something. <laughs> Secondly, I think you'd look really good in one of those mullets. Well, so, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thanks. That's outstanding, good, good stuff. I appreciate it. So our next speaker, Dr. Tim Del Curto, uh, Montana State University, been there several years now. We crossed paths briefly in graduate school. Actually, I was an undergraduate, he was in graduate school, and then I went to Montana, and later, he wound up in Montana through, uh, through Oregon State. Uh, but Dr. Del Curto, um, I'm just going to read a little bit from his bio here. Uh, he, he fits this topic very well. He's done a lot of work in the area of, of these, what I, I consider to be the, the convenient supplementation uh, products because they, you know, they are uh, more convenient. But his focus on optimal use of rangeland forages and matching production expectations to rangeland environments. Uh, some of the things that specific uh, projects he's working on have to do with strategic supplementation, optimizing grazing behavior and resource utilization, and then characterizing botanical composition of diets and diet quality on native rangelands. So thank you, Dr. Del Curto, for taking the time to join us uh, way down here in the Southern Great Plains. For an hour over lunch, we appreciate it. We're looking forward to your comments as well. Thanks, David. <clears throat> looking forward to myself. Let me uh, pull up my presentation here and share it. Okay. That look about right. <clears throat> yeah, it looks great. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to compliment Earl. Um, he gave the talk that I was really hoping he would because it sets up for mine. Um, <clears throat> and um, and um, yeah, I thought it was a, a great talk, and I, it's going to make my presentation a lot easier to follow. Um, <clears throat> you know, first of all, as as uh, Dr. Wallman said, you know. I'm going to talk about just self-fed supplements, um, 
you know, some of the information that we found in, in recent years. I'm not going to walk you through <clears throat> all of the projects, but just some of them. And uh, and I hope you realize what I'm what I'm doing on some of these is I'm condensing my PhD projects down to about three slides each. So <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah, my grad students always get a little upset with me when. I condense, you know, their, their thesis and their three or four manuscripts into about three slides. What am I trying to talk about it from the perspective of what I want ranchers to, to gain from this presentation, <clears throat> what I think they should know, and kind of the bottom line of some of our results. <clears throat> you know, it, it's funny, the land and, and forage resources in the Western U.S., quite frankly, you know, we... we uh, we're always sort of envious of, of, you know, Oklahoma and Texas, Kansas, and even up in the Plain States. <clears throat> Most of the Western U.S., at least where beef cattle production takes place, is in relatively arid climates, uh, less than 20 inches, and the bulk of it between 10 and 15 inch precip zones. <clears throat> we also um, typically operate at relatively high, high elevations, you know, above a a thousand meters or 3,000 foot elevations. And so we do a lot of, um, you know, our beef production system in many cases, is trying to utilize the, the forage base that you see here in this picture. This is a, uh, you know, a Hereford Angus black molly cow uh, in January in the Great Basin. And <clears throat> quite a bit of feed there, but, it, but it's not very good quality. Uh, in Earl's uh, previous presentation, this would have been the white box. It's deficient in both protein and energy. And, and so that's kind of the forage base that, that we're working with. Um, <clears throat> you know, for, for the work I do here at Montana State, um, a big emphasis of our beef industry is re relying less on harvested forages and figuring out how to better utilize these kind of forage resources late into the fall and, and where it's possible during the winter months. And uh, <clears throat> Looking at your program, looking ahead for the producers, um, I know you have a, a lot of uh, presentations on that, basically wintering cattle without hay. And, that, and that's essentially what we're trying to do here. This particular picture is what we call our Thackeray Ranch, our Northern Ag Research Center. Um, it's about 30 miles from the Canadian border. Uh, and it's kind of the transition of the Rockies into the plains. That's kind of the forage base we're looking at. We're also trying to um, do research that's more in line of what producers are actually doing. So we're trying to um, basically supplement cattle uh, in large groups in, in fairly extensive environments, um, which in all honesty, in, in previous research, um, academia, you know, universities, USDA facilities haven't always uh, addressed very well. Um, the other thing we deal with here in Montana, and uh, you guys I know I had a tough winter last year, but but uh, I've been in Montana. I spent 23 years managing range livestock research stations at Oregon State, and then spent the last five years in Montana. And you know, one of the challenges is in the last five years we've had two 100-year winter events. This is up close to um, Haver, Montana. In the winter of uh, 2017, 2018. And so this is an actual slide pretty close to the research center. It shows you what can happen. <clears throat> Obviously, grazing stockpile winter forages don't work in this kind of environment. But, <clears throat> but we've seen two of the, the hardest winters in the last five years that we've seen in the last 100 years. We've also seen two of the uh, most significant droughts. And so <clears throat> it's been a challenge. And it's and it's made us kind of rethink, you know, you know how we advise producers, and and I guess one thing I'll throw out here, and I'm sure Dave and, and the folks there in Oklahoma State's Extension Group are aware aware of this, is our environment and, and how environment affects nutrient requirements is, is really lacking uh, from our National Research Council or our NRCs where we get recommendations for producers. Most of these models are based on the publication here um, on your right. Uh, and they're based on a 1981 publication. So they're a bit outdated. They focus almost exclusively on energy. 
um, little to no information on protein, minerals, and vitamins. And to, to, at this point, they almost all just relate to temperature and hair coat conditions. And, and what we're finding here in Montana is that these models, while they're a good tool, uh, they, they certainly lack uh, a lot of information that we really need for more efficient beef cattle production. They are limited respect to precipitation and at this point don't have any um, wind chill kinds of corrections. So we're trying to add that into our research. Um, <clears throat> in the studies I'm gonna talk about here shortly, you'll see a very strong uh, environmental component to that. Um, the other thing we're using, and it's no different, uh, you have faculty there at Oklahoma State that, that's really adapting to some of these new technologies. This is a, a smart free pro feeder system. Um, it allows us to supplement or provide supplements in very remote, extensive locations. Um, you know, where, where essentially we can gather, uh, you know, information on cattle on a daily basis, supplement intake, and kind of look at this whole idea of, of you know, when we group feed cattle in, in very extensive environments, you know, are we getting the right nutrients into the right animals? So these are big tools, and, and, uh, and, I, and it's pretty exciting the kinds of data that we can gather from this to, to help you know, make better recommendations to producers in the future. Um, our research program really focuses, you know, um, on strategic supplementation, which uh, Dave talked about with his introduction. But what we mean by strategic supplementation, the, the first strategy is only supplement when you need to. Um, but when you identify that your forage base is lacking, you need a supplement, you know, there's really certain things that, that we really focus on in, in our program. And I think they apply to producers in Oklahoma, particularly on, on, on native rangelands and, and winter pastures. Is one is, is what is optimal nutrient delivery systems? In other words, as a producer, how do you get the right nutrients into the right cows at the right time? The truth is, Dave asked me to talk about self-fed <clears throat> supplements which are supplements you just take out, you dump out, and you come back a week later and sort of assess where you're at. They're self-limited by either salt, bitterness, um, it could be uh, texture of the block, you know, a number of kinds of things. Um, but what is the best way to do that? Um, you have speakers in the future that's gonna talk about hand feeding like alfalfa, cottonseed cake, and, and I certainly uh, would be my preference. Unfortunately, here in Montana, I'd say roughly 50% of our producers do the self-fed supplements simply because they don't have access to the cattle and they don't have the labor to get the feed to the cattle um, with, without just providing on a, on a once week, once every two week basis. <clears throat> our goal here, and Earl did a great job talking about this, is not to feed a lot of, a lot of supplement, but feed just enough of the right kind of supplement to optimize the use of uh, the forage here in this picture. And, uh, and so, you know, you look at this forage, um, this is low quality forage. Uh, it's low in protein and, and low in energy, relatively high in fiber. So our goal is to provide enough supplement to stimulate the digestion of that, which will in turn stimulate the intake of it to meet the nutrient needs of these cows. Um, <clears throat> with this technology, you know, we're able to identify every time the cow goes to a feeder, how much it eats. And then as you notice in this picture here, you might notice there's a cow there with a GPS collar on. Uh, we're also in relatively large <clears throat> range pastures. This GPS collar on a once every 10 minute basis will tell us where the cow's at. And inside the GPS collar is what we call an activity monitor that tells us when she's grazing, when she's resting, when she's walking, and even when she's ruminating. So we can sort of, you know, look at supplementation strategies and ultimately then define, well, do we optimize the use of the rangelands? So not only optimize the use of this forage, but optimize how she distributes 
and utilizes the landscape as a whole. So it's an interesting research approach. Um, like I said, it's, it's unique to Montana's uh, producers' needs, um, but, but there's similar work uh, happening at Oklahoma State as well. I'm just gonna walk you through a couple of studies. <clears throat> this first one, we just wanted to look at supplement intake in the cow age on grazing behavior and rangeland use patterns. Number of folks uh, worked on this project. <clears throat> Um, I was kind of the, the lead, and Dr. Sam Weifels, uh, this is part of his PhD program. <clears throat> For this project, I, I don't have um, the sup <clears throat> picture of the supplement, but quite frankly, it was the, the cheapest 30% crude protein supplement we could find. It was, it was a combination, roughly 60% um, canola meal, about 20% wheat mids, and then it had a, a range vitamin mineral mix um, that, that sort of met the needs of a non-lactating cow during the winter period. Just to let you know how kind of these feeders work and, and kind of the way the study was set up, in year one, we did a 45-day grazing period, in year two, a 60-day period. Um, in year one, um, we had 42,472 visits to our feed trailers, and in year two, we had 65,873. So <clears throat> we'll talk about numbers here shortly, um, but we had roughly about 260 cows in year one, um, closer to 300 in year two. Um, and so these visits roughly say that these cows were going to the feeders three or four times a day. I always get questions from, from academics. It's like, well, are you sure with eight feeding stations you had enough for that many cows? And I always contend if you look at our actual uh, feed intake events and, and do that as a function of 24-hour period, you see kind of a normal distribution here where the cows really don't go to the feeders while it's dark. At daylight, they start coming to the feeders at peaks about midday. And then typically by about five in the afternoon. Um, they, they, they're done feeding for that winter period. Every time the cow goes to the feeder and reads a cow EID, we get time of day, entry and exits are recorded, and so we get actual intake of the supplement. <clears throat> for our research, we then couple that with weather station and GPS collar data to get a picture of how the cows use the landscape and how well our supplementation strategy is working. For our study, uh, the average supplement intake was 2.75 pounds uh, per head per day, or one and a quarter kilograms. The target intake, you know, um, for this these first two years was was one kilogram, so we exceeded that. Again, we started out with 272 cows in year one, 306 in year two. Out of the 272, we had 264 cows with with consistent feed records over time. Uh, in year two, 302 out of 306. So they readily ate out of the feeders. The ones that didn't eat um, out of the feeders was either we had a faulty EID tag or um, they were wild cows and just weren't gonna stick their head in the feeder. <clears throat> but by and large, most of them used the feeders and used the supplement quite well. <clears throat> so, this was a salt limited, 25% salt limited, predominantly canola based supplement. And this is the intake patterns we got. In year one, our H class one cows, which were yearlings. And, and just to explain this graph, H class one's yearlings, H class two is two and three year old cows, four and five, six and seven, eight and nine. And then this group is nine and older cows. So we had a wide range of cow ages. <clears throat> Um, and if you look at intake of this 25% or 30% crude protein, 25% salt supplement, it was actually our young and two, two and three year old cows that ate the most. Middle aged cows were, were sort of moderate. The lowest amount was, was our uh, eight and nine year old cows, and then bumps up again for 10 and older. Um, we routinely we'll repeat studies and just make sure there's no year effects. In year two, we see a bit of a difference here where you know we had really good intake with, with our two and three year old cows and, and above and uh, a little bit less intake with our yearlings in year two. 
couple of things to note here. If you go through the literature, one is, is when you use salt limited supplements over time, those cows increase their tolerance of salt. And you see that a bit here with tighter standard airs around these means, with the exception of the older cows uh, and the young cows even less. <clears throat> the other thing that is interesting about this study um, is that um, the PhD student doing this project um, corresponded or modeled the effective environment on supplement intake behavior. And what's interesting here, uh, our highest intakes for the yearlings here in the red line in two and three year old cows was when it was cold, minus 20 degrees C. And those age groups, when it warmed up, ate less supplement as it warmed up. And you can see that the slope of that line is highest for yearlings, a little less. And then if you get down the middle-aged cows here, you know, um, tended to have a bit of a positive slope. And the older age cows, uh, the purple here is, is 10 and older. Uh, these are eight and nine-year-old cows. Ate the least when it was really cold and ate the most um, when, it was, when it was warmer. And so what we're finding is we have a fairly strong environmental influence on supplement intake patterns. Um, but when you think about it from a management perspective, when it gets cold, I want to make sure those yearlings and two and three year old cows are getting supplement, which uh, with this free choice salt limited supplement it appears to be happening. In year two, <clears throat> we got the exact same um, pattern. If you notice though, the entire um, graph shifts up a little bit. I think again, that's, that's building tolerance to salt levels in the supplement and the exact same uh, models here in terms of, of how cattle behave. The other thing I think that's really interesting is when we took each grazing period and looked at the mean temperature, in year one, the, the mean temperature was roughly about 10 below zero. In year two, the mean temperature was roughly about two, or two below zero. And that really explains the differences we, we saw in intake in that previous slide. And so I guess the bottom line here is that, that uh, um, the supplement tended to work quite well uh, with a fairly diverse age group of, of cattle in the pasture. You know, we were getting adequate supplement into those young cows um, and environment does influence the supplement intake behavior. Doing lots of other studies looking at this. I'm gonna show you one here that's uh, Corey Parsons PhD where Instead of a salt limited loose supplement, we wanted to look at a molasses based block that uh, also was about 25% um, salt, but also had limitations due to texture and bitterness. And I'll talk a little bit more of that. <clears throat> um, we have a number of other projects that are in progress and uh, looking forward to, to some of these um, results and publications uh, here in the next uh, 12 months. Uh, we're also looking at minerals and mineral status, uh, particularly during the winter period, and then how that in turn affects uh, protein and mineral status, affects substrate calf growth, um, and, and, and health as we move forward. Um, so the next study I want to talk about is just, just looking at uh, using a, a, um, a molasses-based product. Uh, this study was looking at a cow RFI classification as heifers and, and how that changed feeding behavior and then cow age uh, on a mixed grass uh, rangeland. <clears throat> and a uh, number of people involved with this as well, Corey Parsons, uh, Dr. Parsons, PhD. This particular year, we just used Angus cattle. We had 205 uh, cows in year one, 203 in year two ranged in age from one to nine years of age, had an 84-day performance trial. Uh, supplement intake measures were taken the last 45 days of each winter period. We uh, also um, <clears throat> categorized these cows based on uh, grow, grow safe RFI tests from their yearlings uh, and looking at how that affected um, cow behavior as, as adults. <clears throat> For this study, and it gets back to what Earl talked about, you know, we had a quite a bit of, of native range forage production, roughly in year one, uh, almost 1,800 pounds or kilograms per hectare. 
but um, for producers that relates almost equally to pounds per acre. So 1,800 pounds in year one to start the grazing period, 1,450 in year two. Uh, just clipping the forage to assess forage quality, and you can kind of see it here, is roughly 5.4% crude protein, uh, certainly deficient in protein, relatively high in, in fiber, um, and uh, see TDN values here of 55 to 56. Um, certainly a, a, a basal diet that needed both protein and energy. I apologize, there's a lot of data on this. Here, uh, just to explain this graph, uh, the upper panels are year one, the low panels are year two. Um, and age class, classification here is, is uh, yearlings. Um, Two-year-old cows, three-year-old cows, four-year-old, five to seven, and greater than eight. And, uh, and this here we have um, intake expressed as grams per kilogram of body weight. And before you get really <clears throat> too confused by this, one way to look at this is if it was a thousand pound cow, it would be, you know, this number here would be roughly one and a half pounds of supplement intake. Um, and one of the things we did in this study in year one, we used a product called Bovabox. It was a 30% molasses based baked. Uh, tub and you know really a pretty nice product um, and you can see here that that intake levels across all these age groups were were very similar um, particularly when you express a grams per kilogram body weight keep in mind these yearlings were only probably about a thousand pound animals whereas you get out and certainly three four uh, on up to our older cows we're looking at at a mature cow herd size around 13, 1400 pounds. And so <clears throat> these intakes were actually quite a bit lower if you just looked at a kilogram or a pound basis. Um, so year one, we just used a regular product because the recommended intake is, is one kilogram per day and we, we dramatically exceeded that. In year two, the company put more magnesium oxide in it to increase the bitterness and hardness of the supplement. Um, or at, excuse me, we had that in year one. Year two, we took that out. And we can see we got a little different intake pattern. Um, but it's probably more similar to our canola-based supplement where you know the, the two, three, uh, and four-year-old cows tended to eat more and then those older cows ate less uh, of that supplement. But almost all of them um, met the target intake on the label, which was around here, around one gram per kilogram of body weight. And so just, just sort of things to think about. The other thing that's sort of interesting in this study, I, I know um, you have researchers that are at Oklahoma State look at the same thing. We want to look at variation of, of intake as a function of cow age. What we observed here is those yearlings had the highest variation. Uh, a coefficient of variation of over 110 percent. That drops down uh, below 90, uh, you know, approaching 85 percent for middle-aged cows. Increases a bit um, than for the older cows. And um, and just to put this in perspective, <clears throat> um, what this really means: 100 percent coefficient of variation means they're eating two pounds. That age group is eating anywhere from zero to four. And that will capture 95% you know, of, of the cows. So there's quite a bit of variation here in intake and something to be aware of um, as a manager. But that's typical of these self fed supplements. Another study I wanted to briefly mention before I wrap things up is, is a real simple study, but we wanted to take a canola mill based salt limited supplement and just look at the physical form of the supplement and how that affected intake behavior. And so all we're really doing here is evaluate a loose form of supplement versus a pelleted form of supplement. And uh, in this case, we're looking at, at um, supplementing um, growing heifers on pasture. And so a little different approach and a different type of supplement as, as Earl described in his presentation. For this uh, project, we had a control group of heifers receiving pelleted supplement, the group receiving loose 
Here's kind of a picture of the loose supplement. Here's the pelleted. And then here on my right is just a composition of this for wheat mids made up the bulk of it, you know, some soybean meal. Uh, we use salt to limit intake. And then very subtle differences that, you know, after that. And most of these were differences uh, due to what was required to create the pellet versus the loose form of supplement. But TDN's not particularly high, very protein, moderate, and uh, we're trying to get Bovatech into these animals uh, and improve um, performance on these pastures. I'm not gonna talk about the performance. We did obviously see a response um, with both the pellet and loose supplement uh, compared to control. That's primarily due to salicin. But what I really wanted to show you is the supplement intake and supplement intake behavior. <clears throat> Here, um, by just providing the salt limited supplement in a pelleted form, we increased uh, intake by roughly 40%. Um, um, and um, that magnitude of difference was the greatest the last 42 days of the grazing period. Um, the other thing that's really interesting to note here is our initial intakes, first 42 days, were relatively low here between 0.4 and 0.6 kilograms. Um, but in the last 42 days, as that forage to nest, the animals built up tolerance to salt. You can see their intake of that self fed supplement went up dramatically um, in the neighborhood of almost you know, 1 to 1.36 kilograms of supplement per heifer. Not surprisingly, uh, intake rate was enhanced um, by just taking that loose supplement, putting it in a pelleting form, um, and the time spent at the supplement trailer early on actually was reduced. And these are in minutes, by the way, per day. And so, you know, the, the loose form of supplement, they're only there about 10 minutes per day, whereas the pelleted, uh, less than eight. And, and over time, they developed tolerance to the salt and spent a little more time at the supplement feeder, which corresponds to, to the higher intake. So, you know, as, as Earl talked about in his presentation, not only do you have to think about the ingredients, and how to optimize ingredients, but also the form that the supplement comes in and what you use to regulate intake. In this case, the primary intake regulator was just salt. So I think kind of wrap things up and, and keep us kind of on schedule. Um, just my thoughts on self-fed supplements. And, and like I said, we, we could probably spend two or three hours talking about um, you know, things that you should think about with self-fed supplements. But I think you know, just to sum it up, and, and the one thing I want you to realize is there's significant variation uh, of supplement intake within days. Uh, we had cows that would eat a quite a bit of supplement one day and then and then go two days without. And that was seemed to be their pattern over the season. <clears throat> Both these studies show that we see very strong seasonal effects where tolerance to salt increases and also as forage quality declines uh, during the winter period or, or in late summer, uh, you see these self-fed supplement intakes go up. The other thing I want you to consider is we also see a lot of variation among animals. Whenever you have a coefficient of variation of 100%, I mean, some aren't eat, you know, eating any and some are eating a lot. And, uh, and so you really need to sort of weigh the pros and cons of, of your supplement strategy um, <clears throat> you know, with, with performance expectations. There's gonna be more variation in animal performance with these self-fed supplements. Weekly averages, however, are encouraging. And so when you look at just what an animal eats on a, on a weekly basis, um, you know, it appears that these um, supplements actually work better than perhaps previous literature suggested. Um, and, you know, previous literature um, tended to suggest that those middle-aged cows, the boss cows get all the supplement and the young cows and old cows don't. Uh, to be honest, in the last five years, as we've used this new technology, that really isn't what we're seeing. And so, you know, I, I think perhaps, you know, we need to rethink how these, these different supplements fit 
uh, into our management schemes. <clears throat> um, obviously, future research is needed, and I've probably raised a bunch of questions for several years that, as a result. So with that, if there's any questions uh, for Earl or myself, Dave, I'll turn it over to you to see where we're at. Outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Del Curdo. Since I've got the microphone, I get to ask the first question. The, uh, to me, the interaction of temperature and supplement intake is amazing. And I, I have never seen anything like that published before. Do you think the, is it possible that the older cows are just smart enough to stay back in the brush out of the wind and not go up? I don't know if you're where your feeder was situated, but if it was up in the wind on the hilltop, maybe would that something like that have anything to do with that interaction? I, I think I think Dave, you're spot on. Um, we we put these um, <clears throat> we put these feeders right on a ridge top, um, you know, basically centrally located in in roughly a thousand acre pasture. Um, we did that on purpose because that was the only place we get cell service. And the, and the ah. cool thing about this technology, as long as we can get cell service and I can sit in my office in real time and watch a cow eat at the feeder. Uh, but we also put them on the ridge top to, to be away from water and to encourage them to use, you know, different parts of the pasture. But I, I think you're right. You know, <clears throat> these are a relatively large group of, of cows. Um, I think those young cows, yearlings, first and second calf cows, would go to the feeder because it's cold and they're hungry. And I think the older cows would go find coolies and, and things to get out of the wind and, and honestly hunker down when it got real cold. And, uh, and you sort of see that in those intake patterns. So, um, but I think that's fine. You know, a lot of those six, seven, eight, nine-year-old cows, those are the ones you really don't want to be providing a lot of supplement to. Yeah, um, in, in those yeah that's good. That's good stuff. Well. Uh, I just encourage folks to type their questions uh, in the either the Q and A or the chat. Either one will work. Uh, and if you you know if you'd like to speak, just raise your hand, and we can uh, we can give you the microphone too if you prefer to do it that way. Okay, so uh, Dr. Del Curdo, I've got one question here that says, uh, were there timid cows that had minimal trips to the smart feeder? And the and the answer is yes. That's, that's actually a really good question because uh, um, the, the cattle we use for, for all those studies um, that I, heifers are really easy to train to smart feeders, um, particularly in a, in a pasture setting, they're curious. Um, the cows we used at, at Northern Ag Research Center for, for these studies, the first thing you need to know is, is they were trained on grow safes uh, as heifers that are developed in, low, in lots with grow safes. So, so they weren't, you know, they're accustomed to eating out of feeders like that. Um, the non-eaters, the ones that didn't eat, yeah, they, they were, uh, in most cases, were timid. Um, you know, they're kind of the high-headed cows, the ones that, uh, that don't trust you in the barn lot. You know, so yeah. <laughs> they're not going not gonna to trust a machine out there. Um, we, we've experienced that, too. I mean, I, I think everybody has a cow or two that won't even come up to range cubes. Yep. out in the middle of the pasture for crying out loud. And so there are definitely some cattle that are not going to go to some piece of machinery yep. and stick their head in there. Just not going to happen. The nice thing about the Smart Feed Pro trailers is it's just a feed bunk with feed in it. You know, the, the Super Smarts, which, which actually might have more applications to the rancher, has a conveyor system. And so it reads the cow's ear tag, it, it augers out the appropriate amount, but that makes a noise. And, and <laughs> you can have a yeah. little more problems training uh, cows with that system versus what we used. Yeah. Uh, another one for uh, Dr. Del Curdo, based on your environmental data, would you recommend feeding the two-year-old cows separately? Oh, good question. Um, based on our environmental data, I would recommend um, actually, that the two-year-old cows are fine. The, the, the ones I'd probably think about uh, would honestly be the yearlings. You know, and, and this particular 
or this research station, they always run the yearlings together with the cow herd during the winter period. And the yearlings did fine with the uh, salt limited loose supplement, but they did not do well with the um, molasses baked base block. And uh, we followed that up with other studies and found that in all honesty, uh, yearlings and, and, and molasses based blocks don't work very well. Um, part of it's they don't know how to eat that block. They haven't figured out um, you know, how to eat it. Uh, and if you watch mature cows and, and molasses based blocks, you'll, you'll notice that it's kind of painful to watch, but they will literally scrape, you know, they'll, they'll take their, their one set of teeth and, and scrape those blocks to, to get adequate intake. Whereas I don't think the younger cows have figured it out yet. Interesting. Good stuff. Earl, I have a question for you. Um, for folks that are feeding the blends, the commodity blends, um, are, what percentage and what's your recommendation relative to feeding them on the ground to get some of that you know, grazing distribution Dr. Del Curto talked about or using bunks um it depends to me it depends on where you're getting it um so for instance most places in eastern oklahoma if you get a four-way it's four different pellets or four different ingredients just mixed together uh i know of one place that because of the way their system's set up it's the same four ingredients same mixture but they're all ground together and put into one pellet oh. um so Gotcha. Same, same thing, just different form, like, like Tim was talking about. Um, so anything loose, unless you're needing and you have extra money for fertilizer, I would feed it in a bunk. Um, but, you know, and that's why the three quarter inch pellets are probably the most popular in Eastern Oklahoma, because 90% of the people are feeding them on the ground, um, moving them around, looking at that, you know, we don't have thousand acre pastures. <laughs> to to you know so but even moving them around and, and feeding them in certain areas for wind breaks and things like that feeding them on the ground does have its advantages but there's also a loss there uh but using those bigger three-quarter inch cubes sure helps with that so and the wetter the winter the more loss you have yeah okay so uh dr del Curter on the on the loose grain versus pellet study did you see difference in uh, health or body condition scores given the larger intake of the pellets? Yeah, we, we did not. We saw both groups, uh, we saw roughly about a 15% increase in weight gain and, and body, well, body condition. I'm not sure if we, we saw a statistical difference or a little bit better as compared to the control non-supplement. So, but we didn't uh, see a difference between the, the two physical forms. Um, but one thing, and, and we did, one of the things we've been worried about, the beef industry is very cavalier about how they use salt. And, and, uh, and so, and one of the things we've observed is that, you know, be careful of just mean intakes. Uh, for instance, on, on the first haver study I showed you, we had one cow that would eat roughly about eight kilograms of salt limited supplement in a setting and then go a week without eating again. And so we were concerned that, that perhaps, you know, according to NRC, that's almost a, a, a salt sodium chloride overdose. And so we've actually did some research on, on high and, and infrequent um, salt intakes, how that affects low quality forage. And, and up into you know, where they consider a toxic range, we're seeing kind of minimal effects. So, so these cows left to their own devices have figured out how to deal with salt. <clears throat> I, I don't understand it fully, um, but they all seem to have kind of variety of different um, approaches to how they use salt in supplements, or we've even looked at salt levels in water and things like that. And, and it's been very interesting. Very good. Uh, here's uh, another question uh, related to cows that don't visit the feeders frequently. Uh, Dana says, I would assume that those cows that did not go to the feeder 
and lower body condition. Is that a correct assumption? That's a correct assumption. <clears throat> um, we've actually published a lot of these data. I was trying to keep it within our time frame. Um, sure. We correlated actual uh, supplement intake and, and to beef cattle performance during the winter period. And, and as you had guessed, we saw a significant relationship between supplement intake and cow body weight change and um, uh, body condition at the end of the winter period. And so, um, yeah, you know, obviously the ones that eat will do a little better. <laughs> the thing that's encouraging to us is, is that it seemed to be fairly uniform across ages with the exception of those yields. Okay. Well, uh, one last question for you, at least for me. Um, in Northeast Oklahoma, do, are you seeing a change in supplement types in terms of you know, frequency of uh, your producers using uh, liquids or, or the blocks? Is it kind of like what you think it would have been 10, 20 years ago? Is there a identifiable trend? I, I don't know. I think uh, you know, most of my education that I put out is not favorable upon liquids and tubs just due to going back to that cost per cow, um, uh, managing consumption, things like that. I think that there's fads, um, things that come and go. I know big ranches that use tubs, but that's not their sole nutrition. Um, I think that you know, if that's, I always tell everybody that that's a really good insurance. You know, if you can't get there, you know, several times a week, having that tub out there is a really good insurance, but there's a convenience cost to that, whether it's liquid feed or whether it's uh, a tub, you know, the liquid feed, you have to make sure that you have a lot of you know, a forage availability with it. And a lot of times people want to do that when they're already overgrazed or don't have enough hay set out. So, um, I don't know. I, I I would say it comes and goes, people. But I mean, there's no matter what I do, I, I think I will retire still preaching the same thing that that I talked about today of picking the right supplement for that. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm yeah. sitting here looking at your poll, and you know, you got 58 percent saying they feed 20 percent cubes, and I agree, 20 percent cubes is the most versatile one because I can feed it to my cows, my replacement heifers, and my bulls, or whatever. But if I'm just looking at the cow herd, I mean, it's got to be a perfect situation of, you know, having the right cow size and the right nutrient requirements and right forage for that 20 to be the most economical. And if I have a 100 head of cows saving a, a penny a day, you know, or a couple of pennies a day sure makes makes a difference. Yeah, 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 for sure. I, and and the, the point about just doing your homework, finding maybe a professional to assist you if you have questions, if you're not confident in your decision, there's nothing wrong with spending some time with your extension educator, your area specialist, you know, what, whatever feed industry professional uh, to really dig into those questions. You know, I, we know that we think there are some situations where the urea based products, the convenient based products actually work really well. Uh, like when you have a real narrow gap in the protein deficiency, they seem to fill that gap pretty well. If you're already wanting to feed some fermentable carbohydrate source of uh, some of your own corn that you raised or ground milo or something like that, then some of those urea products actually fit better. But you may need to seek out the help of someone who's dealt with these questions, or reviewed the literature and so on uh, to make those decisions and have some confidence. Okay, well, it looks like maybe we got one more question here and then we'll try to wrap this up. Let's see. Um, okay, so Kaylee says, when you talk tubs, are you saying flax, let's see, flax lick tubs or range tubs? What about feeding loose mineral and loose salt versus salt blocks and mineral blocks? <laughs> I'll let whichever one of you want to tackle that or both have at it. Go ahead. I'd like to hear what you said. <laughs> that's it. That's oh, it. Yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> when, at least in my presentation, when we were talking about um, the, the tubs, and it's a, it's a product called Performex Bobovox, 
and it's it's basically a baked molasses a range um, a supplement. Um, boy, you know when you mention um, I, I'm kind of like everyone else in in Earl's spot on. You know, look at the price of these things. The first study I talked about was was twenty five percent salt loose supplement. Um, that was the cheapest supplement that I thought was made up of really good uh, um, nutrients and fit sort of range cows in the winter period. It cost us three hundred forty dollars a ton. That Bova box study, that block, uh, I'll be really honest with you, eight hundred dollars a ton. Um, it has a lot more technology in it, um, more limitations to intake. But some real problems. <clears throat> in regard to salt, salt blocks versus versus uh, salt limited trace minerals. Yeah, that that's that's a whole nother uh, conversation. I think Dave will have to have another session on on that. <laughs> um, the the truth is, one of the challenges we have in in the beef industry, you know, in North America or anywhere for that matter is we have pretty poor delivery systems for trace minerals um, and, and trace mineral salts loose versus block. Um, and I'm kind of with Earl on this. I think when you, when you can put trace minerals and vitamins in your supplement and hand feed it, that's probably the best route to go. Um, but as an insurance policy, having that, uh, you know, that, that supplement feeder or those blocks out there is, is always good as well. I don't know. What do you think, Earl? You help me out on this one. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, I, I know a lot of times I'm the tubs. Um, I always use an example. You can buy a 20% tub for, let's say, 60 bucks. It's a 200 pounders. Well, that's 600 pounds per ton, right? Well, I can buy 20s in, a, in, in the bulk right now for 325. I can buy it in a bag for, you know, 360 probably. Same product just different delivery. Uh, the tubs restrict my, my intake. If I have to feed three or four pounds of it, there's no way I can get cows to eat that out of a tub. Um, the loose salt or loose mineral versus uh, blocks. I'm a big fan of loose minerals uh, and I'm gonna say minerals because um, I want to have that free choice mineral out there for the animal. I would use loose salt to help monitor intake, but the salt would not be my mineral program. The, I would have a, a balanced mineral. Um, and there's a lot of great products here in Oklahoma, um, you know, retail products that we can get. You get up to Montana, Wyoming, those guys, you know, they're formulating minerals for, for specific ranches. And we really just don't need that too much here in Oklahoma that I know of, whereas we can buy a retail product that would cover all of our bases. So. I would have out a, a really good loose mineral that they're consuming and use loose salt or even a salt block if I needed to, to, to monitor intake. So 